live stream now, Ilaria. Okay. And it has so with another started. minute or so? Yeah, whenever you're ready, you can start. Okay. I think people are still joining. Okay, I guess um, we can start. Um, welcome everyone uh, to the Astronomy Colloquium. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce you to Jia Liu, um, who's a um, postdoc fellow at uh, uh, BCP, BCCP, the, oh, sorry, I can't. Uh, the Berkeley Center for Cosmological Physics. <laughs> and um, she uh, did her uh, bachelor in uh, business, ma business management, is that correct? Uh, at uh, yeah. uh, Guangdong University. Uh, and she moved on to do a master in human resources and industrial relations. Uh, so not quite the usual uh, <laughs> A curriculum of our colloquium speakers. Uh, but then she got derailed into astronomy uh, and she did her PhD uh, at Columbia University. And then uh, she moved, she also, she got a position uh, at NSF a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton. Uh, and she's now in her second year postdoc uh, at Berkeley. Uh, she, her research focused mostly on uh, large-scale large structures, formation, uh, and she, she has been she working on both observation, on the CMB, uh, and as well as on simulations, uh, and uh, she's really interested in uh, studying uh, nature of dark energy and neutrinos, and today she's going to talk about uh, the cos cosmology with massive neutrinos. Um, take it over, Gia. Oh, also, wait, announcements. Um, if you can um, keep your uh, video, if you're comfortable in having your video on, uh, it's nice to uh, see people while you talk. Gia would really appreciate it. And also, you can ask questions directly. Just unmute yourself and ask a question during the talk. Uh, and uh, Or you can write questions in the chat. I'm going to keep an eye on it. Um, or, of course, you can wait till the end. OK, Gia. Take it over. Thank you, Ilaria, for the great introduction. And yes, please turn on your camera. So I have been encouraging people who uh, uh, join my journal clubs so always turn on their video. So we have some human interaction during the pandemic. And also, yeah, just feel free to yell out your question. And in fact, I will have some question for you guys. So you have to pay attention to my talk or try your best. Okay, I will talk about cosmology with massive, massive neutrinos today. So this is the standard model of particle physics. You have the bosons uh, in the center and then the outer circle are the fermions. If we put all the fermions on the mass or energy scale, this is what you see. So the six quarks and the three lepton, electron, muon, and tau, they all sound lie in this cluster of MeV, GeV, maybe one close to TeV range. But if you put neutrinos on this energy scale, they like here. 
So from current limit, we know that they have to be smaller than around EV. So just looking at the pattern of all the fermions, you would already find there's a really peculiar gap, six orders of magnitude gap in between these two clusters. So this prompts the question, what is the mass generation mechanism of these neutrinos that both being, they're all um, fermions, but why are their masses so light? So in the landscape of dark matter theory, so uh, using one of the promising mass generation mechanisms for these light neutrinos, they can be coupled to right-handed steroid neutrinos. And in some theory, this steroid neutrino can potentially be the candidate for dark matter. So understanding the active standard model neutrinos uh, can be also uh, considered a portal to the dark se sector for us. So what do we know about neutrino masses? We can measure the mass square differences from neutrino oscillation experiments. So from this experiment, uh, we have two numbers already, but we don't know the absolute value. So therefore we have two ways of arranging the three neutrino masses. Uh, in the normal hierarchy, we have one large mass and two small masses. And in the inverted hierarchy scenario, we have two large masses and one little mass. The problem with this, this picture is that we don't know the mass, hence there's a question mark here, for the lightest neutrino. However, that's not a problem. We can still um, just assume this mass to be zero and we can get some interesting numbers. So for normal hierarchy, we know the sum of the three neutrinos must be larger than 0.06 EV. And for inverted hierarchy, it will be larger than the 0.1 EV. So these two numbers will become very important throughout this talk. So please uh, keep them in mind. How about the absolute mass of the neutrinos? We can measure um, the mass scale from both particle experiments and cosmology. So current limit from particle ex experiment is from the Katrin um, tradient decay experiment. They measure the beta decay and measure the endpoint of electron spectrum. So from Katrin, we have current limit of 1.1 EV. From cosmology, the best constraint comes from the recent uh, re results from the Planck satellite combined with BAO uh, data and we have 0.12 EV. Just looking at these two numbers, we can see that cosmology is doing an order of magnitude better than part part of experiments. So this is very interesting. But in the next 10 years, we can do better than this. In the particle experiment front, we're expecting to see the sensitivity to improve to 0.2 EV, again, from the Katrin experiment they are still running. For cosmology, we are expect to see a sensitivity to go down to 0 0.3, 0 0.03 EV or even lower. So again, this number is still order of magnitude better than part of experiment. And this sensitivity is estimated combining several experiments, including LSSD, Simons Observatory, CMBS4, DESI, and I will talk about them later in my talk. But if we just look at the number from cosmology, 0.03 EV, and compare to the number I showed you in the previous slide, which is the minimum mass of neutrino sum, 0.06 EV. This number is lower than 0.06, means we, we will have very strong measurement of neutrino mass, um, either by measuring the actual mass or have very strong hints of the mass. So you might wonder how come neutrino mass, this uh, traditional particle parameter can be measured so well in cosmology. And I will give you a quick introduction for cosmic neutrinos. This is the brief history of our universe. Extremely briefly, the left-hand side is Big Bang right-hand side is today. I only want, want to point out 
one important epoch on this picture, it is the cosmic microwave background. It happened 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It is when the photons decouple from the matter and free stream towards us today. So this is very familiar to uh, probably all of you. And I want to point out the epoch right before that or much earlier before that which is one second after the Big Bang. Very similar thing happened. Um, neutrinos used that back then, decoupled from matter and free, free stream towards us today since then. And that is the cosmic neutrino background. So what do these neutrino particles do uh, to our structure formation? Let's take an example of an overdense region in late times. So this is a cold, um, this is an overdense cluster region. And for most uh, dark matter particles, which we consider them to be cold, if they see an overdense region, they will just sink into the center of this potential well because they are cold. However, neutrinos, even though they are matter, because of their high thermal velocity, when they see this overdense region, they just stream through it without stopping. So neutrinos, even though they are um, matter, they don't contribute to the matter formation or clustering of matter on small scale. So the, small, uh, the scale uh, of their free stream is about 100 megaparsecs. The effect of neutrino is to smooth away structural formation on scale smaller than that. As a result, if we see two simulation boxes side by side, one with zero neutrino mass, one with massive neutrinos, this is what you see. On large scale, they're very similar because above 100 megaparsecs, they behave just like cold dark matter. But on small scale, they become different. You see less clustering in the massive neutrino uh, scenario because of their free streaming. So the next question is, okay, we can see by eye this uh, numerical simulation where uh, in fact, I <laughs> cheated a little bit. This is much larger neutrino mass than our current uh, limit. So, this, so you can see the effect by eye. But this suppression is really obvious and then it's something we want to measure. And then we want to ask, how do we quantify this level of suppression? The typical way to do is with the matter power spectrum. Uh, for a non cosmologist, this, imagine you have rulers of different size, and th that that uh, is the red uh, curves I'm showing you here. And rulers, you just drop them in your sky, a different direction, different location. And at the end, you do this many, many times and sum over or average over um, the rulers and ask. How likely do you find over density at the end of the rulers? And you average over all rulers and you get the matter power spectrum. So on X axis is the wave number K, which is inverse of uh, scale. And on, uh, on top, I also show in real space to guide your eye. So left is large scale, cosmic scale, and the right hand side is small scale, galactic scale. Vertical axis is the power. So the higher it is, the more likely you'll find over clustering on that scale. So the matter power spectrum can be measured by many techniques in cosmology, including CMB, galaxies, clusters, weak lensing, lemma alpha forest. And power spectrum is the most important thing, one of the most important measurements to be made in cosmology because it is sensitive to dark energy, dark matter, and neutrinos. So the focus of my talk today is on neutrinos. So let's pay attention to just the neutrinos now. Here I'm showing you the power spectrum for multiple neutrino masses from zero to all the way to one EV. On cosmic scale, large scale, we see that they overlap with each other. So because there's not much effect of neutrino on large scale. But on small scale, you see that they differ. It is easier to see in the ratio plot like this, 
where it is just the ratio between the color curve and the black curve. The level of suppression is directly linked to uh, the mass of neutrino. The larger it is, the higher the suppression it is. And again, on, on large scale, you don't see much. How do we model the effect of neutrino? How did I generate all those curves? So this is cosmology 101. How do we uh, model structure formation? To model it, we need to solve a list of PDEs, including mass conservation, momentum conservation, and the Poisson's equation, which links uh, the density in the universe to the gravitational potential. One ingredient we need to add to all this equation is that we're living in the expanding universe. And the expansion of uh, our universe is uh, linked directly to the density of radiation and matter, the curvature of our universe, and the dark energy content of our universe. And that tells us the speed of uh, ex uh, expansion. When you put uh, these two ingredients together, we get this updated equation. So usually solving this equation is not easy, but we can make some assumptions to make it uh, solvable by assume the density or over density or velocity or potential is very small. So on very large scales here, uh, scales hundreds of uh, megaparsecs, over density is indeed very small much, much smaller than one. And then we can linearize all the equations and just keep the first order term and throw away all the higher order terms. And then we can write out the solution by hand. So this is the regime where we can solve uh, structure evolution using linear theory. On scales smaller than that, things become mildly nonlinear. So over density delta is smaller than one, but not that much smaller. So we can still be smart uh, and keep fewer high, few higher order terms, just go to higher order terms and still get a solution. Harder, but it's doable. However, when you go to the very small scale, galactic scale, delta is much larger than one and we can no, no longer play this trick. So in this regime, um, everything is highly nonlinear. We cannot throw away any higher order terms at all and numerical simulation is the only way to go. And I showed you earlier in, uh, the effect of neutrinos. And if I overplot with all these regimes, we see that it is on very small scales, neutrinos have uh, the strongest effect. That says that if you want to study the effect of neutrino, you'd better use numerical simulation. And that, that is what I and my collaborators did. So the next part, I will focus on the nonlinear regime where neutrino effects are the strongest. Um, quickly, I want to go over the set of simulations that uh, will be the base of my scientific result that I'll be presenting later. The massive new simulation, cosmological massive, new, uh, massive neutrino simulation. It is 100 high resolution simulation with varying neutrino mass. So here I'm showing the parameter space um, of the simulation. Everything else is fixed at uh, near Planck level, but I vary the three parameters, including neutrino mass, matter density, omega m, and AS, which is the primordial clustering amplitude. So I changed these two other parameters because they can be very degenerate with neutrino mass. To vary them simultaneously, we can study the interplay between these uh, parameters and hopefully find a way to break the degeneracy. So each of this black point is a high resolution simul neutrino simulation. And you can notice that they are not on a regular grid. So I arrange them somewhat randomly in a way that it makes it optimal to interpolate between these points. So uh, even if I do not, I did not simulate a point in some of the space because the way 
I uh, chose this point, I can still interpolate or we use emulator to model points uh, within this region. So with these simulations, we generate a lot of data, 300 terabytes of data. Of course, it might not be too big for hydro simulation people, uh, but this is a lot of data we put out. And also we made a 20 terabytes of data public, including particles, halos, merger tree weak lensing and CMD lensing. And I really welcome people to use them and play with them. And uh, um, currently this has been used by almost all major uh, cosmology collaborations. If you're interested, please talk to me. I can help uh, get your hands on this simulation. So I also want to show quickly show uh, the nice faces of the students I work with. It's a great diverse group of students and they, it has been a great experience working with them. And I will show uh, the science results from some of their paper. Okay, let's go back to the power spectrum that I mentioned. It is very important for cosmology. However, I want to point out one issue with power spectrum. Even though it is great, it is only complete for a Gaussian field. And I want you to convince yourself next that this is not enough, okay? So here you're looking at six maps and they are the projected over density of dark matter distribution. Imagine projecting um, the cosmology simulation along the line of sight. And the, um, so the red points are the overdense regions along the line of sight, and the blue regions are the underdense regions. So five of them are Gaussian maps, and only one of them is from simulation, or you can consider it as the real, real uh, overdense region, or overdense uh, map from the universe. And now I welcome you to turn on your mic and shout out the answer, which one you think is the real universe? Which map? Four. Four, I see, I hear you, four, four. Mm -hmm. Yes, I also see hands. Is that three or four? Three, I see one, three. Okay, so, I'm sure if we do a vote, number four can stand out very quickly. Of course, uh, if you're not familiar with maps like this, so it can be confusing as well. But four is the non-Gaussian map because you can look at the patches of all these red points over dense regions. They are the clusters of galaxies and you don't see much of that in other places. This is the sign of non-Gaussianity. However, even though you are able to tell them apart by eye, if I show the power spectrum of all six maps, they look like this. Map four is the non-Gaussian map. So isn't it bizarre that by looking at the power spectrum, there's no way you can distinguish them. And in fact, I generated all other maps using the power spectrum I measured on map four. So by construction, they are the same. So this is really worrisome because we see there's some information that's lost uh, in power spectrum measurement. But if we look at all these maps differently, looking at uh, the histogram of all pixels or the PDF of the map, you can find uh, different shapes. Here, all, three, all five other maps, Gaussian maps, they look like this, very typical Gaussian shape. But map four looks different. So it's skewed and you have a long over, uh, over dense tail here. So how do we extract this non-Gaussian information that's, that's lost in the two-point correlation function or the power spectrum? So I talked about the analogy of dropping jewelers for the power spectrum. The most naive way to um, get this non-Gaussian information is simply going to the next order with bispectrum or in real space, it is called three-point correlation function. So instead of dropping rulers, you drop triangles of different shape and different size. So if this is a Gaussian field, bispectrum should be strictly zero and non-Gaussian bispectrum measures non-Gaussian information. So with massive news, uh, 
we went out and measured the bispectrum of the lensing map, assuming LSST-like survey. For an uh, equilateral shape like this, we found the bispectrum of massive and massless neutrino um, are different. And that is also different for different redshift, redshift one and redshift two. So such bispectrum is indeed sensitive to neutrino masses, similar to the power spectrum. Interestingly, if you look at bispectrum or triangles of different shapes, this is a squeeze limit. And you have one, one short leg and two long legs. And the bispectrum, again, it is sensitive to neutrino mass. That is the difference between solid and dash curve. And also they have redshift evolution. But different triangles, they show different sensitivity to neutrino mass because the shapes are very different. So translating this curve to cosmology, this is work done uh, with uh, Will Colton, who was a student at Princeton. We found that bispectrum um, is very comparable to the power spectrum. This is parameter constraint uh, expected from an LST-like survey for um, omega m and neutrino mass uh, plane. So just for neutrino mass, bispectrum is somewhat similar to the power spectrum, but then the shape of these two contours are somewhat misaligned, showing that they have um, different information. So when you combine them, you break the degeneracy to some extent, and you get this red contour. This is the joint power spectrum and the bispectrum results. And we found that is 30% tighter than if you only use the power spectrum. So this is by using exact the same data set, but applying uh, different analysis or adding new analysis um, tools. And you can get the 30% improvement almost free. This is super exciting. And we, we couldn't help to think, can we be greedier and go to higher order? Can we do quadrilaterals? And uh, even, I don't know even what it is even called if you go to um, fifth order. But generally, this is not a good idea because when you go to higher orders, there will be many possible shapes. And it's also not guaranteed that they will always uh, have the, the most information the next order. And it's computationally prohibitive. So what we want to do instead instead of this brute force way of going to high order is we want to have some simple, compact summary statistics that can contain a lot of order uh, information from many orders. I want to introduce only one such statistic uh, that, that is somewhat well studied, the peak count. So this is specifically peak count for weak lensing maps. Um, what we do is simply go through each pixel of your map and pick out the ones has uh, higher values than its surrounding pixels. So when I looked into simulation, I found each pixel that are peaks are related tightly to massive halos in the simulation. So looking at these peaks, they preferentially picked out the highly nonlinear region. Again, in this cartoon picture, on a large scale, they're very similar, but on small overdense regions, neutrino had the strongest effect. So intuitively, uh, peak counts could be a very sensitive tool to neutrino mass. So non-Gaussian peak counts has been measured uh, in our 2015 paper using the first large weak lensing survey called CFG lens. So on top uh, panel, you can see uh, the green points is the measure, uh, are the measurement. They look very Gaussian, and the dash curve is the Gaussian uh, map assumption. However, if you do a fraction uh, or ratio plot on the bottom, you can see some deviation. This is the first time we measured uh, deviation of lensing peaks from the Gaussian random field assumption. And this is the extra information we can see from in this field from weak lensing peaks. And currently, we cannot constrain neutrino mass, but in the future, we hope to do so. So we did forecast for LSST with peak counts. So similar uh, projection of parameter space uh, as 
what we did with uh, bispectrum here, I'm showing for the peak counts instead. Again, the blue curve is the power spectrum and peak counts is this orange contour. So peak counts alone seems to already do much better than the power spectrum. And then when you combine power spectrum and peak counts, because peaks has a lot more information, you get this black contour that's very similar to peak counts. So what we found is using peak counts alone on LSSD weak lensing map, we can get 40% tighter constraint than the power spectrum. And currently we are uh, investigating uh, relevant systematics with peak counts and hoping to implement this uh, with LSSD data in the future. But next, I want to shift your attention slightly to different regions of our universe, the void regions in our universe. So we like to ignore them typically because uh, they don't shine. There's not much to see, it's mostly empty. But volume wise, they account for the majority of the space in our universe. I got interested in voids because the size of voids are typically few tens of megaparsecs, somewhat comparable to the free streaming scale of neutrino mass. In addition, because voids are somewhat empty, so you don't have a lot of other things going on, but neutrinos is pretty much a, just a flat or um, smooth background everywhere. So naively voids, you will have a lot more neutrinos fraction wise than the rest of um, the universe. So with um, student Christina Kreisch, who is, uh, who is at Princeton, we looked into the impact of neutrinos on void statistics. So unlike for halos, where you think of the mass for a halo as its uh, character, we think of uh, size for void, the, pretty much the radius uh, for each void. So indeed, we found some signature of neutrino mass on void. For large voids, we seem to find less of them if we have massive neutrino. But then for small voids, we seem to see more of them. So the physics behind um, is, some, is pretty intuitive for large voids because neutrino suppress the structure growth. So you have, you have less, less time for the matter to flow into over dense region. So they somewhat just stay uh, in the void region and then you cannot have very large voids as the result. And the story for small voids is somewhat complicated. Uh, we see in simulation, both shrinking of voids, but also breakup of larger voids into smaller voids. So the total number of voids is not conserved in different um, neutrino mass cosmology. So to translate void counts to cosmology and to uh, the constraint on neutrino mass, we use Quixote simulation. So this is a very recent work led by a student, Adrian Bayer uh, at Berkeley. So we combined different statistics together and uh, checked um, their sensitivity to neutrino mass. So matter clustering is the typical two point correlation function. And the halo count is the halo mass function. And the void is what I described, the void size uh, and counting void as a function of their size. And in the plane of neutrino mass and the sigma eight, sigma eight is the matter um, fluctuation in the universe. We found that even though matter clustering on its own is pretty powerful, the most powerful probe for constraining neutrino mass, uh, which if you just project this contour to this uh, y axis, that is the constraining power even though it's the most powerful because voids and the halos, they have completely very different degeneracy than matter clustering. When you combine them all together, you get this tiny, tiny contour in black. You barely can see without us blowing it up um, in the insert. So this is very a uh, first step that we attempt to include somewhat non-traditional uh, non statistic to constrain neutrino mass. But this made a lot of simple assumptions. For example, halo mass function, uh, we did not take into account the of baryonic effects. 
And the voice becomes it. We search voice in the matter field, but in reality, you probably have to search that in the galaxy field. But this really preliminary work already showed that there's a lot of potential to include things beyond the power spectrum. Next decade, what do we expect? So we have many exciting cosmological surveys coming online in the next decade. Just to give you a sense of the improvement, Vera Rubin Observatory, um, the data each night will be 15 terabyte, which is 10 years of SDSS. And number of galaxies we expect to observe will be 10 billion compared to 10 million from SDSS. So that is very exciting, but I want to say that LSST is not the only one we need to uh, constrain neutrino mass. We need multiple uh, surveys. So next, I want to um, go over the importance to combine different survey data. So this is expected, uh, for, this is a forecast for constraints from future surveys on dark energy, which is another parameter that is very interesting to um, the cosmology uh, community, as well as neutrino mass, the one that I'm particularly interested in. Using CMBS4, a CMB survey coming online in order of five to six, seven years, you don't really get constraints really well because um, you can only measure one um, redshift, and you cannot break parameter degeneracy using just CMB data. You can do a little better if you include um, geometry data from BAO, because BAO is very sensitive to dark energy uh, through the change of uh, growth, sorry, the change of geometry, not growth. But even that, you cannot get a good constraint on neutrino mass because BOO is not very sensitive to neutrino mass. From the galaxy survey site, LSSD galaxy clustering can measure the power spectrum, but in the galaxy field, so you have a biased tracer of uh, the matter field, you have this red contour. Again, you can't get a great constraint. With weak lensing from LSSD, you get this blue contour. So weak lensing has the advantage that you measure the matter field directly, but it also has the disadvantage that it is projective field. So you cannot have a great resolution along the line of sight. But of course you can combine uh, galaxy clustering and weak lensing and get the green contour. It is better, but still not great. And it's, you still cannot constrain neutrino mass if it is at the minimum value of 0.6 EV. And the orange contour is when you combine both CMB and galaxy data from S4 and LSST. And that can push us to real discovery. So I mentioned only two uh, surveys or three surveys just now. Uh, in the future, we are seeing many, many cosmological projects coming online. To give you an idea of the timeline, this is an incomplete list of uh, upcoming surveys, Galaxy in blue and CMB uh, in pink. So we'll see uh, ground surveys for Galaxy from LSST and several space surveys, including Euclid and SphereX and the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. So a lot of them are are expected to scan almost half sky. And CMB front, uh, we expect to see data from the Simons Observatory very soon. Simons Observatory is expected to overlap almost entirely with LSST and gives a great potential to do joint analysis. And later, uh, we expect to see a full sky survey from Lightbird and the ground-based uh, CMBS4 survey. How do we actually constrain or discover neutrino mass with um, those great projects? I want to mention two challenges. One is the optical depth in CMB observation. 
again, coming back to this uh, image, uh, I said that CMB photon will, would be free streaming towards us since CMB last scattering surface, which is not entirely true. So something happened around redshift eight to 10, that is uh, realization. So the formation of first stars and galaxy make the universe a little bit more opaque to the CMB. As a result, we are actually measuring not just the amplitude of the primordial CMB, but the combination of this amplitude and this optical depth tau parameter. So measuring only the CMB temperature and anisotropy, we cannot tell these two parameters apart because by varying tau, you can always change AS, AS um, to match that variation. And to measure neutrino mass accurately, we really need to have an accurate uh, measurement of AS or the amplitude of this curve. So that is the problem. To cope with that, uh, CMB polarization data can help. So on very large scale, around L smaller than two, tau has an uh, effect on this region. So quadruple scatter power spectrum will be scaled around uh, scale by two tau. And uh, within, with this region, AS and tau can be broken, the degeneracy can be broken. However, because this is such a large scale, re you really need full sky CMB experiment, polarization experiment, and ideally on the sky. So currently our understanding of this tau parameter is from the Planck satellite. And the next generation service, uh, Simon's observatory is on the ground and it's not full sky. It will not be able to measure tau. So we are somewhat stuck with Planck tau for a while until Lightbird. So this is the parameter uh, forecast for tau and the neutrino mass. We can see that currently, this is what we expect with Planck tau, CMBS4 and uh, uh, Euclid which is very similar to uh, what you expect from LSSD. You have this large degeneracy. But if you can improve tau significantly with Lightbird, which is a space polarization uh, CMB experiment, you can get from this red contour to the blue contour. So if you are at minimum mass with this blue contour, you are already guaranteed to have a three sigma discovery. So the story now is with Lightbird, you can combine it with any one of the, uh, the galaxy surveys and you will get a discovery. But without Lightbird, we are struggling at the three schema level. Of course, uh, Lightbird is not the only one can measure tau. You can measure using um, uh, 21 centimeter experiment such as Hera, and you can push even down to this green contour. So before Lightbird flies, if you want to squeeze out more information, I want to come back to this uh, result I showed you earlier. With matter clustering, we get this red contour, but if we can improve our modeling of voids and the halo counts, we can potentially push to discovery earlier. In order to do that, well, of course, we have a lot of difficulties to overcome, mostly theoretical modeling. One major challenge is the effect of baryons. So what do baryons do? Feedback from bary baryonic feedback, such as star formation and the AGN feedback can push gas outside of the halo. So if you compare the distribution of star particles like here, and the gas particles, you see that gas particles are puffed up. So this is really worrisome because this signature is very similar to neutrino signature because neutrino, you can also think of it as puffing up of um, small scale structure or smooth away um, the small scale. And if you look at power spectrum, um, the feedback um, can suppress the power spectrum on scales smaller than around megaparsecs. So this is showing you the suppression of the power spectrum 
from several hydrodynamic simulations. So one takeaway is the signature is very similar to neutrino, this dip here. The second takeaway is all these curves, they're everywhere. <laughs> that means we are somewhat clueless about baryonic effect right now. Um, so this is really bad news. And in fact, we're already limited by the modeling of baryons. So this is the two point correlation function of galaxies from dark energy survey, which is the current generation survey. And what you're seeing is um, the black points, they are the beautiful data points you measure from the survey. And here you can see the gray scale. Those are the scales thrown away in the analysis because they are small scale and the baryons have very strong effect on those scale. And we think we don't know how to model them. Therefore, we just threw them away. So this is really unfortunate. If we don't model baryons better, the same thing is gonna happen for all future surveys. We have to throw away perfectly beautiful data. So it is not just a worrisome for the power spectrum. It is also worrisome for cluster cosmology. This is a recent result looking into um, the impact of feedback on cluster cosmology. Um, the true cosmology will be this dashed black contour. And the blue curve is if you think of this effect that because of baryons, uh, you expel material out of your galaxy. And as a result, you change the shape of this, of your halo. If you fail to take into account the shape change that is departing from NFW profile, you get many sigma of bias from a Euclid-like survey. And in addition, even if we let our parameter fitting go free, so we can fit the shape of the profile perfectly, and if we can even get the perfect measurement of um, the halo mass, we can get this orange contour, which is still biased. And the source of this bias, even with perfect measurement, is because the mismatch of the measurement and the simulation. Because if your simulation is dark matter only without uh, taking into account baryonic feedback, you will get a biased um, halo mass function. So to, in attempt to mitigate uh, baryonic effect, we look into its impact on various non-Gaussian statistics. So it turns out some statistics are, are severely impacted by baryonic feedback, but some others are not so much. So left-hand side, the lensing peaks, which are thought to be um, associated with large halos, will get indeed some impact, which is the red contour. If we ignore uh, feedback, However, for lensing minima, which looks into is the 2D void in lensing maps, look into the void region, we found even you don't model baryonic feedback, you don't really get any bias for LSSD. So you don't get gray constraint, but you don't get bias constraint. So ideally, we can even use different statistics, combine non Gaussian statistics and the two point function, and constrain baryonic feedback um, using the impact, different impact of them. Because eventually you have to move all these red contours to the correct value or a consistent value. So that, uh, that also being said, if we want to really maximize the potential of halo counts and voids, we really need to understand how baryons impact this region. So the modeling must take into account baryonic effect and astrophysics effect. And before I conclude, I want to say that uh, I talked about this future surveys. They are not only useful in constraining neutrino mass or other cosmological parameters, they will be useful to help us understand baryonic feedback as well. So as we go along this timeline, we will have improved observation, which will in turn help us to improve our simulation. And I really hope by the end of 2020s, 
we will have a updated number of neutrino mass and no longer a question mark. With that, I want to summarize uh, what I talked about today. First, massive neutrinos have highest potential to lead to yet another discovery uh, in physics. But to achieve that accurate modeling of nonlinear scale is very important. And finally, joint analysis of CMB and the galaxy service is the only way to reach discovery. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jia. Uh, this is very exciting work. Um, so we are now uh, opening the floor for questions. You can either write in the chat or just raise your hand. Um, uh, I see already a question, uh, Liam, if you want to unmute. Hey, thanks, that was really great. I wanted to ask about going after non-Gaussianity with peak counts in weak lensing. Okay. What, what are yeah. the main systematics there? Or is it the case that like Vera Rubin and LSST will just find all the galaxies and hit cosmic variance? So, sorry, you mean non-Gaussian statistics? Yeah, and going for, for peak counts, what are the main systematics? So I, I mentioned the baryonic effect is one thing we worry a lot because the peak counts, they are the most smaller scale. So that's the scale where we expect variants to have a lot of effect. Uh, but also we also worry about intrinsic alignment. So that is really well studied for two point function, but not so much for higher order statistics. So that is the alignment of galaxies um, because with some physical uh, interaction. Yeah, so that's, and also the typical ones like photometric redshift, photo Z error is something we also need to worry. Thanks. And I don't have answer to you yet of exactly how much, uh, wor how, how worrisome they are. Um, yeah, but we have to model all of that out. Okay, I see Phil has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I guess I was wondering, following up on the, the Baryons, which, as you know, I'm very interested in. Um, yeah. Do you have a sense of whether there's, you know, other observations that, given given the pretty deep uncertainties, are there other observations those models could be calibrated to that would help without just calibrating out everything? Right, like some people are trying to fit the models now to SZ observations, and I don't know. Is there a medium ground where we can calibrate the models to something of the baryons observable without just fitting out all the interesting information, if that makes sense, what I'm trying to ask? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think there are many observations that can be useful, even with um, galaxy observ observation alone, they can be useful. For example, DES, I mentioned they cut out the sound scale, but then I think some in independent work using DES data and alone can already rule out some of the models. I think they rule out of one of the strongest feedback. I forgot which one. Yes, maybe uh, illustrious. They ruled out, or, or that's, that's their upper bound just by looking at the inner shape of uh, galaxies. Um, so other observations from the same experiment, CMB, like you said, um, KSZ, TSZ, they are expected to go down to arc minute scale. That's my understanding. That can already be helpful. And the uh, X-ray observation can certainly be useful as well. I think there are some X-ray uh, missions coming online as well. Yeah, so going to high resolution, go down really to the center of um, a halo region will be important. Um, Olivier? Yep, thank you, Ilaria. Thank you, Jeff, for the nice talk. I have a question regarding you, you, the work when you, you plot when you combine all the statistics, which is, of course, uh, uh, exciting, like the halo mass function, the yeah. peak statistics, and the clustering, et cetera. Yeah. And I was wondering if you looked with your simulation, but ultimately on the voice, of course. And all, but ultimately, you know, they are all statistics from the same field, and so they're all very correlated. And I was wondering if you looked at how 
the importance of the correlations for this, um, the covariance yes. between these various statistics for this particular statistics in this case. Yeah. So, um, so turns out now, now I can't remember which one of them. One of them is not that correlated, but then there is, so halo counts, they are, there is some correlation between halo counts and the matter field. But what is interesting, it's what seems to be somewhat independent from the other two fields. But I should look at my <laughs> covariance matrix. Um, but I want to say that the whole, the final combined analysis, we did take into account the full covariance of the three probes. Oh, okay, very good, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But the, exactly the, their, their correlation, I need to think about it. Look at my paper and tell you again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, Wen Bin. Oh, hi, uh, nice talk. So I'm really not an expert in this field. So I was uh, looking at one of your plots uh, uh, on the neutrino mass and and the CMB optical depths, scattering optical depths, and then the there's a joint constraint. So I was wondering, uh, um, yeah, this one. So I was one, uh, I'm only looking at the red curve. So I was yeah. wondering, does this one suffer from a uh, baryonic physics uncertainty or is this one just set uh, by, I'm uh, only- Yeah. No, this one, I, I think this is the work in this paper. I don't think they consider baryonic effect. No. So this only the basic lambda CDM parameter and the neutrino. Yeah, so. So I can imagine that with baryonic, systematic uncertainty. So the actually upper limit of m nu, m nu of 0.12 is less so uh, reliable, right? So uh, I, I don't think baryon should be a big effect here. I think they apply very conservative cuts as VS stuff. So where you already wrote out baryonic effect. So we can also turn that story around. If we can model out baryonic effect, and go to smaller scale, we can, we should be able to improve on this a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so I want to just quickly mention that this tau uh, optical depth to scattering, which is, which depends on a total column density of electrons, free yeah. electrons, yeah. may yeah. be measurable by FRBs in the next, I don't know how many years, depending on whether we get those high redshift FRBs at redshift six you, or seven. Um, because they tell you probably you the, need a super high FRB, high redshift. Re yeah, yeah, you, you need uh, FRBs yeah. between redshift six and 10. You need something uh -huh. like a hundred of those. I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> well, that would be great, yeah. Anything that can help with Tau will be wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the talk. Thank you. Um, Sri, you're next. <clears throat> yeah, actually this is uh, the slide. I had a qu question on this slide itself. <clears throat> which is I wanted to understand uh, if we don't have an idea of this tau electron mm -hmm. scattering from observations, do I understand that CMB observations would be useless? Oh, no, 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 that's not that. <laughs> that's not the case. So CMB S4, it cannot measure tau, but it's still very useful because you have lensing from CMB. So that is measuring the... Uh, um, matter uh, fluctuation at higher redshift because usual galaxy lensing can all, only measure the matter power spectrum or matter uh, fluctuation on, at lower redshift, probably below one, redshift one, but CMB can measure higher at redshift two, three. So, so that is very important because you need that redshift range to break the degeneracy of parameters and also break the degeneracy with uh, astrophysics. So one thing I mentioned is baryons because baryons suppress um, growth and just like neutrino, but neutrino, we know it was there since, since the Big Bang. So we can model it really accurately, the redshift dependent, but then we know baryons, they really play an important role only at low redshift. And um, we expect using different redshift measurements or so-called tomography will be very helpful to break all this degeneracy. Okay, yeah. but insofar as this plot is concerned here, if I don't have so, an informative yeah. of tau, then yes. 
then this particular thing, this particular diagnostic fails. Am I right? I'm not sure. No, what you I'm saying you is you don't have thing. improvement on tau. Yeah. You still yeah. can have hope to get neutrino mass. Okay. The red one is without tau. Without it's with only Planck tau. Sorry. Yeah, so that's not terribly interesting because it's it encompasses both values of your lower end, both inverted and non-inverted or whatever, the normal and inverted, this range. Um, so, but hierarchy is not the only thing we care about. We care about the absolute mass. So this is assuming the minimum mass 0.06 EV, but we don't know where the center is. If the center moves to higher region, we still can have hope to get some, get weak constraint. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being dense here. But I look at N no, no, okay. I'm, I look yeah. at N new, it goes from zero to 0 0.12 and the yeah. red curl has it all and then I'm, I know nothing. Then I'm not worried about little centroid shifts. I mean, big mm -hmm. discoveries need big proof, not, not modest, mm -hmm. not big curves. Mm -hmm. um, okay, then the other question had this, you had something like SK, SKA1. Oh one yeah. N, what is that? So this is uh, intensity mapping from 21 centimeter. So they can give us measurement of the matter part spectrum at even higher redshift. And also maybe they can give us better tau. So yeah, it is um, Wait, 21 so centimeter measurement. At what redshift? Uh, depends on, sorry, I'm not familiar with SKA, but uh, close, some of the 21 centimeter code can go up to four, six, depends on the frequency they use, but potentially higher than CMB, my understanding is. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not so yeah. sure I understand that, okay. Because SK so, has yeah, so parts to it, so I don't have, know. You can have a me measurement of the power spectrum, not just around redshift, two and zero, which is included mostly in Euclid and CMB F4, but then at even higher redshift. So the so higher, the, the better. So this is SK low, or is that what you're talking about? I don't know SK, you don't the, answer. You maybe have to look at the Is this the SK low or high parametry? What's this, is this SK low or high <laughs> or mid? What are we talking about? Um, below say 300 megahertz. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think that's very speculative then. Thank you, Sri. Uh, okay, uh, Zia, I have one last question for you and then we have to move to uh, your meeting with the faculty. Mine yeah. is more of a curiosity. Um, I, you showed at the very beginning of your talk, you showed this, uh, the particle experiment, uh, Catherine, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so you said that in the future iteration of the experiment, uh, they will still get a sensitivity that is you know, lower than current constraints of mm -hmm. the cosmological constraints. And so I'm wondering, yeah. like, is there a point to it? Like, I mean, uh, do they hope to find a different result from cosmology? Because cosmology might have, like, it's cosmological constraints might have some uh, systematic that we don't understand, or is it just, um, I don't know. Wondering what That's a it. great question. So, uh, yeah, like, by looking at this, you might wonder, like, why bother? Like, just <laughs> just trying to try, but uh, the point is cosmology, we measure only the gravitational interaction of neutrino. So they don't have to be neutrino, they can just be a light particle that behave like neutrino. Um, and uh, there's no way, also where cosmology is also measuring cosmic neutrino, maybe they change when they arrive on Earth, so we really don't know. Um, so Katrine is measuring the neutrino list of neutrino ness of neutrino. So through the weak interaction, beta decay. So they know if the neutrino we know, uh, we observe on Earth. Eventually, if we have a measurement from cosmology, it is very important to have independent particle experiments to measure exact the same. So it will give them a target to measure and potentially maybe help their funding situation. Um, yeah, I don't. I wouldn't say they they should be out of jobs soon. It is really complementary uh, experiment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you everyone to join us and uh, all the